true with Microsoft or, or General Motors. Of course it's true with children making sense of meaning. And yet there are people who recite the mantras of the tools for continuous improvement who have children carrying around data binders <laughs> who put stuff up on the wall that are showing numerically the degrees of progression toward some goal of achievement. That's the opposite of Deming's intent. It's the opposite of what the research suggests. You don't like Deming? In Texas, of all places, at Rice <laughs> University, Linda McNeil said, measurable outcomes may be the least significant part of learning. Measurable outcomes may be the least significant part of learning. You know, like Linda McNeil, maybe you've heard of Albert Einstein. Not everything that counts can be counted. Not everything that can be counted counts. Mm -hmm. Folks, let's, let's take an example your next door neighbor who's not in education can understand. It's easier to quantify the number of semicolons used correctly in an essay than it is to quantify the number of wonderful ideas in that essay. Therefore, the more focused you are on data, especially in numerical terms, the more trivial your teaching becomes. The more you're likely to assess the commas, because they lend themselves to being measured, and you can proudly show with umpteen tools your progression, your march to continuous improvement, even as your teaching becomes more trivial. That's the poison of taking the qualitative, that which intrinsically resists being reduced to numbers, and turning it into numbers anyway. Little minds really like to count stuff, because that politicians love this. You know, they, they're used to this. Assessing votes or poll numbers. Many corporate executives, despite Dr. Deming's cautions, We'll just talk about return on investment, or our quarterly earnings report, and as he pointed out, do significant damage to the long-term prospects for quality in their organization. That's true by a power of 10, where we're talking about children's <coughs> desire to learn. It's not just that some tests and rubrics are bad, it's that the idea of quantifying performance is inherently problematic. That's the radical notion of both Deming and social and educational psychological research. Don't ask, how do we quantify the extent of improvement in their homework? Ask, why are we assigning homework? Don't focus on which grade or the criteria for earning it. Look at the problematic aspects of grading itself. Remember. The more you quantify, the more likely it is that kids are likely to be Ed Koch and spend their time asking, how am I doing, and become less interested in thinking like a scientist or a historian or whatever. The absurdity of this. In a Deming-influenced school, we would not have any talk about measurable objectives we would not have people fixated on learning targets. We would be talking about how to create a place that taps and nourishes and sustains kids' desire to make sense of the world. We would be interested in excellence, and we would occasionally use various assessment tools and strategies to give us some feedback about how the system is doing. That would very rarely, if ever, be numerical. Would never be competitive in their implications. And would not, in any case, suffocate the learning by happening too often. Even the best form of authentic assessment is damaging if it's overdone. Most of the time, kids should not be thinking about how well they're doing something especially below high school. Most of the time, they should be completely immersed in the doing. And that's why 
Deming's principles, while powerful and radical, are insufficient in my judgment because we also have to bring in people whose history, whose background, whose passion is the nuts and bolts of education itself. That's why you can't ask any question about Deming principles in schools without asking whether this curriculum is worth learning. And whether the instructional approach is helping kids to construct meaning as opposed to merely transmitting information in, or knowledge even into an open receptacle. I always know I'm in for a hard time at a school that uses a phrase like delivery of instruction. Unless the faculty is sending out for pizza at their staff meeting, the word delivery has no place in a school environment because it reflects a century-old notion of kids as passive receptacles of information. So we always have to be asking, getting better at what? And how much say did the kids have in this? which is a whole presentation in its own right that I don't have time for. But there are schools that really congratulate themselves on giving students the discretion to make minor modifications in fundamentally stupid practices. <laughs> you get to how should we, says the teacher who prides herself on being uh, advanced in her thinking, how should, what would be the best way to memorize the multiplication table? Ooh, 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 we could take, we could divide it up by, step back. Why should kids have to memorize the multiplication table, especially as a discrete task, as opposed to learning those multipliers they need in a context and for a purpose when they've been given a student-designed project where they have to use a certain budget to redesign their bedrooms, where area and perimeter come into actual use. The more you make kids push certain facts into their memory by rote recall as a separate activity, the more of a sign that is that this is not something they will need on a regular basis. Vocabulary, spelling, grammar are mere means to an end. As a friend of mine says, I don't care if kids can spell well, I just care that they can edit well, which means that before their papers are released out to the world, they don't look like an idiot. And some of them are, have a good repository of spelling words in their heads already. They are good spellers, but some of the smartest people I know are lousy spellers. So what do they do? They use spell check, they use the person sitting next to them, whatever. The point is not to be a good speller, it's merely to read and write more effectively and to bring kids in on the decision because, and I've been using this little bumper sticker idea for a long time, and I like to think that Dr. Demi would have approved of it. Kids learn how to make good decisions by making decisions, not by following directions. And the major obstacle to having kids make decisions that matter, when I say that matter, I mean the ones that have the capacity to make us gulp. Because if kids can't make choices that make us uncomfortable, they haven't been given real decision-making authority that counts. And the major obstacle to having them do that is our reluctance to give up control. Ask me a question. Sure. I've gone on too long and I've spoken too much, but I want to make sure that we have, if you don't mind, a couple of minutes to ask a brief question, and I will try to restrain my answer to be brief. I as can't well. make it brief, so okay. somebody else can. Thank you for recognizing that. Yes. Some of my principals drive me crazy because they won't let kids into access 
to high level rigorous courses without jumping through all these data points that they have to hit. Even if other indicators like effort and the will and the love of learning yeah. are there, you can prove them, they still, you know, these data points, they're not going to be successful because they didn't hit these data points. What would you suggest? Yeah, the principal who says, I need these data points in order to let kids take these high-level rigorous courses is like teachers teaching reading with these damned leveled reading systems where you're only supposed to read what's on your grade level, plus or minus, as opposed to letting kids choose. When kids, in the absence of rewards, when kids are able to make decisions about this, they tend, most of the time, to choose tasks that are just beyond their reach of what they're comfortably capable of doing. We can offer feedback if they like it. And the same thing is true about course selection. What ultimately predicts to excellence in a course is kids really enjoying the course. And so the extent to which the kid got to choose what course to be in is a predictor in itself of probably thriving and giving kids a chance to say, no, this is beyond what I thought, or yeah, it's an interesting topic, but this teacher is driving me crazy. I'd like to be able to come back. But, you know, so we need to provide Take a step behind the principal's words and policy and ask, what is the principal afraid of? And is there a more authentic and less destructive way to allay those fears and meet those objectives of making sure that the placement makes sense to the kid and for everyone else, given that in the process we do enormous damage, which we need to show the principal when we quantify. And then let me just mischievously quibble with the premise of your question, which is that just because it's a rigorous course doesn't mean it's any better. Right. Mm -hmm. Advanced placement courses right. are among the hardest in high schools, but they are often an accelerated version of the worst form of textbook-based, lecture-driven, test-oriented. Mm -hmm. That's why many good high schools, public and private, have gotten rid of AP courses. In part because they don't want the curriculum written by the damn college board yeah. major. Yeah. <laughs> so let's not ever assume that just because the course is more rigorous, it's a better course. Same thing with a book or a test. Yeah? So you said a lot about what you don't like about current education practice. Yes. I want to test whether or not I understand what you would like. And it seems to me that you're advocating a kind of Socratic approach to education, where it's all about discussion and Testing uh, people's ideas and the way they articulate what they think. I don't think I would necessarily call it Socratic, especially in the original sense that Plato told us Socrates meant, which is about drawing out the correct ideas already in the kid's head, which is not about changing one's process or, or belief. But if I had to do a kind of quick standing on one foot what am I looking for? In case I hadn't been clear enough in terms of inverting what I've been criticizing, I would say the following. What turns me on when I visit a school is some combination of the following. Kids having a major role in making decisions at both a school-wide and a class-wide level about pedagogy, curriculum, assessment, and how we live our lives together in this classroom. With kids together, coming together in class meetings on a regular basis with the teacher to decide how the room is going to be decorated, how the furniture is going to be arranged, how we solve problems together when we don't get along, what we're going to read next, and so on. Second, I don't want to just see the absence of competition. I want to see the presence of collaboration and a sense of caring community not just within classrooms, but on a school-wide level that means regularly bringing together kids of different ages. So everyone starts to feel, I'm part of an us. I think in the plural. This is not about how good I am. It's not only just about self-esteem. It's about a sense of a community of learners who are doing things together. And in many cases, I can't succeed unless you get it too. That happens in tutorials in small collaborative learning groups, and in things like class meetings where we little by little build a sense of community of caring. Third, I want the learning to be organized not around facts and skills and separate disciplines, but around questions and problems and projects. 
and most of those will be interdisciplinary. So in order to do justice to this idea, I'm going to have to develop some proficiency at reading, writing, math, science, social studies, and so on. And these are extended, collaborative, student-designed projects where kids are really grappling with ideas from the inside out. Go ahead. One of the issues I've got, though, is that some of the things that we try to get kids to learn took many hundreds of generations for mankind to discover. I mean, ge geometry, algebra, these things are not intuitive, they're difficult. They're, and you're not going to pick that up from first principles. I guess that depends if our goal in mathematics is to turn kids into basically calculators on legs, or to have them learn to think like mathematicians. Because if it's the former, then we need to have them rehearse and practice math facts and algorithms that have been developed over hundreds of thousands no, of years. I, I, I would say, don't try and teach it. If they engage with a problem that requires it, then guide them in that. Right. Or if we want them to understand the underlying principle of why you flip over the second fra fraction when you divide it before you multiply it, or that the fact that an equal sign doesn't just mean here comes the answer, but refers to a concept of equivalence, which many adults don't even understand, or to truly grok the notion of place value, then you have to have kids, as the great Connie Kameen put it, who's my authority on early childhood arithmetic, you have to have them reinvent the concept of place value by not showing them the correct procedure for deriving it. It's slower, but when they get it, they get it. And the same thing is true with respect to upper level math, where it becomes extremely problematic to justify much of what's done in Algebra 1 and beyond, especially the way we teach it. There are remarkable books and videos, some of which you may have discovered, but it all depends on whether your point of departure is to make kids proficient according to conventional test-based criteria or if your goal is to have them, A, understand the principles of mathematics, and B, get a kick out of them. And if the latter is your goal, then merely telling them and having them practice. The best math teachers do very little practice work with kids and typically give no homework, even at the high school level, because their goal is for kids to understand math. And I've been in some of these classrooms where kids take an entire period debating the definition of a pyramid. And I think so much time better spent because this is not about covering a curriculum. It's about discovering ideas. And unless we've made that shift from covering to discovering, then continuous improvement is a fast-paced waste of time because we're improving at stuff not worth doing in the first place. And now, the fact that David is vertical suggests <laughs> that we have run out of time. Let me tell you that I really appreciate your willingness to take at least the cone interpretation of Deming to the point where it might make us unsettled. And that was my goal. If you agree with everything I said, then I'm glad to validate you, but I'll have to try harder. Um, on my website, alfiecone.org, if you put .com, you get there anyway. It's like magic. But on my website, I have literally hundreds of articles and essays on the kinds of issues that I've raised and that I think some of you are raising in your other sessions in this conference, uh, free for the, for the taking. And I hope you'll join me uh, in this adventure to give schools that kids really deserve a chance, even if it means becoming rebels. Yeah. Thank you. So right now, we'd like you to uh, rate Alfie's performance from one to ten. <laughs> And we're going to compare that against past performances and see how this is. Uh, just a couple of dimming things that came to mind, but uh, 1993, I had an accident and was in the hospital and so missed a, a keynote performance I was supposed to do. 
And uh, three or four weeks after the uh, conference was over, I had to bow out of that. I get a performance rating from Peter Schultes, and he'd gotten a whole bunch of people to rate my performance. It was one of the best keynotes I ever gave. <laughs> and they had comments on the bottom and all kinds of things. So, uh, just a couple of quick uh, 